I've noticed that you like when I make videos analyzing constitutional cases. That's why I decided to make this video where I'll be explaining a case that will help us understand a bit more about the principle of separation of powers and also responsible government. The case is called Dignan and it was decided by the High Court of Australia in 1931. Hello everyone, my name is Renato Costa and this is Aussie Law. Today we will be analyzing three cases. The first one and the most important one is called Dignan from 1931. The other two cases are subsequent cases to Dignan. They are called Radio Corporation and Wishart. I'm sure you already pressed the like button because that's the way that I'll know if you like the videos that I've been producing or not. And obviously, if you liked it, that's because you're already subscribed. But just in case, in the remote possibility that you are not subscribed yet, now is the time to do it. You just have to click the subscribe button and that's all. You'll be part of our Aussie law community. I have mentioned Dignan's case in the video that I did about the separation of powers and its operation and application in Australia. And I mentioned it because Dignan recognized the possibility of the executive legislating, the executive exercising a function that belongs primarily to the legislature. That's right, you heard me well. Since there's no strict separation of powers in Australia, it is possible for the executive to legislate. Now, two questions remain. First is, what can the executive legislate about? And the second is, what are the limits to the legislative powers of the executive? Let's see what the High Court had to say about these questions by analyzing Dignan's case. There was a certain regulation, regulation number three of the Commonwealth Transport Workers Act. And that regulation said that the members of the Waterside Workers Federation were to be given priority in employment. There was this guy called Campbell. He was chosen by Meeks and employed by the Victorian Steve Doreen as a Waterside worker. However, he was not a member of the Waterside Workers Federation. I'm not sure if I'm saying the name correctly. Victorian Steve Doreen, Steve Doreen, Steve Doreen. Anyways, English is a second language. Dignan, a navigation department inspector, realized that fact and laid the information before the Victorian Court of Petty Sessions. So Mix and the Victorian Steve Doreen both were convicted under the regulation number three. The thing was that the regulation was made by the Governor General and it was given force by an act of parliament. But it did not mention anything about the preference given to the Waterside Workers Federation. On top of it all, there was already an award, an industrial award, under the Commonwealth Conciliation and Arbitration Act between the Waterside Workers Federation and the Victorian Steve Doreen. And that award also did not mention anything about a preference or a priority to the members of the Federation when being employed. So Mix and the Victorian Steve Doreen decided to appeal to the High Court of Australia and the argument went in basic terms that just like there was a separation of the federal judicial powers from the other branches, there was also supposed to be a separation between the legislative powers and the executive powers. That is, the executive could not legislate and therefore the regulation that was giving that priority should be invalid. Furthermore, the argument even went on to say that the regulation could not prevail over an act of parliament. So the question that the High Court of Australia had to answer was, did the separation of powers in Australia prevent parliament from delegating legislative powers to the executive? If not, then the question was, could that regulation, the delegated legislation, override an act of parliament? The High Court of Australia decided that the legislative powers given to parliament by section one of the Australian constitution 
were only those powers that were considered the primary powers to legislate. So what it means is that if Parliament has the primary power, these powers do not prevent Parliament from delegating to the executive some subordinate or secondary powers to legislate. As such, the legislative powers need not be separated from the executive powers. As Justice Evatt put it, it is very difficult to maintain the view that the Commonwealth Parliament has no power in the exercise of its legislative power to vest executive or other authorities with some power to pass regulations, statutory rules and bylaws which, when passed, shall have full force and effect. On the same way, Justice Dixon said that although it looked like there was this sort of asymmetry between the treatment that was given, um, it could still be acknowledged that the manner in which the Constitution accomplished the separation of powers does logically or theoretically make the Parliament the exclusive repository of the legislative power of the Commonwealth. What he meant was that the theoretical basis on which these delegating powers were given and operated in Australia and without confronting with the separation of powers in its application here was that Parliament maintained the ultimate legislative control. That is, the legislative power still belongs to Parliament and Parliament can repeal the Enabling Act at any time. So if Parliament removes the delegated powers then the regulations will not exist anymore and they will lose the force of law. But if they still remain in power, they have the force of law notwithstanding anything in any other act. And this is very important because this answers the second question that was before the High Court. When it comes to the delegation, to the extent of the legislative powers given to the executive, the High Court of Australia decided that the delegation can be made in the widest terms. There is no problem in Parliament delegating legislative powers to the executive extensively. However, there are two limitations. First, the terms of the grant, although broad, cannot be uncertain as to the subject matter. There must be a clear head of power or heads of power under which the regulation is being made. And the second is kind of an obvious limitation because the executive cannot go over and beyond the limits of the Enabling Act, the act that delegated the powers to legislate. Of course, if it is ultra-virus, then the delegated legislation will be invalid. This was something that was recognized by the High Court of Australia Justices in Dignan's case, because there they said that if the legislation made by the executive went beyond the scope of the Enabling Act, that legislation was to be invalid. So, from Dignam, we learned that the powers to delegate lawmaking powers is very extensive, and that the ability of Parliament to supervise and maybe even repeal the delegated legislation still exists as part of its primary function according to Section 1 of the Australian Constitution and also according to the greater scheme of the application of the separation of powers in Australia. Now, let me just very briefly go over two other cases that confirm the decision of the High Court in Dignum. Radio Corporation was a case decided by the High Court in 1938. It relates to the importation of certain goods from other countries into Australia. Specifically, the Customs Act provided that some products prohibited by regulation would be prevented from entering Australia. A certain regulation was made and because of it, Radio Corporation could not, was prevented from importing certain goods um, into Australia. When the High Court of Australia ultimately decided the case by a majority of four against two with Justices Dixon and Evatt in dissent, the High Court upheld the validity of the regulation and confirmed the possibility of the Parliament delegating legislative powers to the Executive. 
the majority of the High Court said that even if the delegated powers were being used to implement government trade policies, that was still within the competence of Parliament to delegate those powers to the executive. And in this case, the Customs Act was related to trade and commerce and taxation, all under a head of power in section 51, 1 and 2 of the Australian Constitution. This leads to the conclusion that the executive is authorized by the Constitution to control the imports seeking to enter in Australia. And that the executive can be left to its own discretion in imposing conditions and restrictions to the importers. The other case in this trilogy is called Wishart. It was decided in 1941. In this book, Professor Lane says that this case has to be read with cautions just because it happened during wartime and it relates to section 51.6, the defense powers of the Australian Commonwealth. But still, what happened was that an act of parliament authorized the executive to issue a regulation to secure the public safety and the defense of the Commonwealth and its territories. There were some express limitations to the extent of the regulation. Like, it couldn't extend compulsory military service, it couldn't impose court-martial trials of civilians, among others. The powers were still pretty wide though. So Wishart was convicted under one regulation and he decided to challenge the conviction on three constitutional grounds. First, that the parliament could not delegate its legislative powers. The High Court rejected that argument. Second, that the doctrine of the separation of powers prevented the executive from legislating. He obviously didn't see my videos. The High Court also rejected that argument. And third, that the powers that were delegated were so wide and uncertain that it fell outside of section 51.6 of the Australian Constitution, the defense power. And guess what? The High Court also rejected this argument. So, what can we learn from Dignan and the other two cases? That the executive can legislate if it received delegated powers from Parliament to do so. That there are limits to that delegation. One of the limitations being that the true repository of legislative powers is and ought to be the Parliament. The second limitation, that the executive cannot exceed the scope of the delegation. And limitation number three, the Parliament can only delegate that power to a certain extent, that is, according to the constitutional limitations and also according to an appropriate head of power under the Constitution. Finally, I hope you can also see that this also relates to the principle of responsible government, primarily because Parliament still is the main repository of the legislative powers and therefore it will have a supervisory role over the executive. So although giving delegated powers to the executive, Parliament still has the function of oversight over executive decision making. All in all, since Parliament still has and maintains the authority over the delegated powers, then it can still hold the executive accountable. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please don't leave without leaving a like and also subscribing to our channel. I hope to see you again very soon. Until then, ciao.